coming. He's gonna get it. There he goes. Right underneath the ice. That's a good one, bro. That's a real good one. Here he comes, here he comes. There's two fish coming, actually. There's two fish, two fish. Ooh, you got a runner. Oh, that's a good one, man. <laughs> that's a good one. Hey everybody, I'm Brian Spinner and thanks for joining White Dog Outdoors. If you've watched any of our ice fishing videos, you know how much I love to jig lake trout through the ice, but that I use a very specific technique when I'm doing it that I, we call the chase. Uh, I did a video on this a few years ago and it's been a really popular video. I think a lot of people have enjoyed doing this. We've had a lot of people tell us that they've learned a lot and they've caught their first lake trout through the ice by doing this. It's just an incredibly effective technique that is literally the most fun you will ever have on the ice. So I would definitely recommend, if you haven't seen that original video, go here and check that video out first, and then kind of come back to this one. You want to make sure you have the basics and understanding of how we're doing this technique. This video is going to be more advanced techniques. Um, so getting sluggish fish to bite, so tips and techniques that, to try to get those fish to bite. I've guided a lot over the last couple of years, and I've seen some of the mistakes that people make unknowingly that keep them from getting that bite. And by coaching them through certain situations, I'm able to get them to get that bite. I've changed up some of the gear that I've used in terms of jigging rods and you know the, the setups for those. So I kind of want to go through that stuff. And then going into some of the baits that I use, you know that if you've watched the previous stuff, I like to use a lot of swim baits, but that's not always the best way to go. So different baits that I like depending on the water conditions. And then also a couple of updates on sonar units. We've had a lot of questions uh, on the sonar units and just a kind of a couple of tips there. I'm gonna try to link as much Stuff as I can down in the description of this video so you can kind of see the baits that we use, the rods that we use, um, the, the sonar units that we use, all those different things. You can kind of go and check them out yourselves. For this particular video, we're going to be doing a giveaway. I had some hats made up. These are actually a, a Carhartt hat. They're super warm. I've been wearing mine for a few weeks, um, mostly for cleaning my driveway, unfortunately, but they're a great ice fishing hat. And, um, you know, for anything you're doing outdoors, uh, they're super warm and they're really, really good hats. So, um, anyway, we're going to be giving away one of these hats. All you got to do to take part in the giveaway is be a subscriber on the channel, like the video, and leave a comment letting us know what kinds of things you want to see. I'm specifically interested to see if you guys are interested in this kind of merchandise type stuff. I haven't done this kind of stuff before. I just had a few made up. Let me know if you're interested in more of that kind of stuff, either for giveaways or to buy on your own. Okay, for my rod setups, I have changed a little bit about my rod setups in the last couple of years since the first video. So in the first video, I said, you know, medium to medium light. I definitely tend to more than medium. I want a bigger backbone for setting the hook on fish that are a little bit deeper. Um, this one is a little bit shorter. This one is, I think, 27 inches. I actually like to go a little bit longer in the 30 to 32 inch range. This one here is just about my favorite ice fishing rod. Um, it's got a lot of backbone to it, but a soft enough tip that I can handle those fish around um, the hole when they start thrashing around the hole. Um, so a couple of important things. I want a locking reel seat. I don't want one of these ones that's like this, where it's just these things that push up on it. Those can come loose and they become a real pain in the butt. I've had clients reeling in fish and next thing you know, the, the reel is coming off the, the, the handle. So I avoid those types of rods. I want a locking reel, sight, like, reel seat like this. Um, I love this rod. It's my favorite rod. I actually just ordered another one. This is a, I'll, I'll link everything in the description to all the stuff that I use so you guys can see and, and find the different things that I use, whether it's this kind of gear, the sonar units, anything else. Okay. Um, the other part that's important is having a good reel. Um, I like a good spinning reel. I go with a Shimano Sienna a lot. Um, it's an affordable but good reel. I want to make sure I have a good drag system because when those fish are coming down, they're going to be peeling line. You want something that's smooth and not jerky. Okay. The big change that I've made in my jigging rod setups is that in the first video, I said I used the P-Line Flora Clear, which I still use on some rods. Um, and there's, there's not a lot of stretch in that, but there is some stretch on that. I have moved to braided line on my... On my, on my spinning rods. Here's the key though. If you're in weather that's below freezing, braided line is not going to be good. Uh, it's going to absorb the water, it's going to freeze, and it's not going to be very usable. It may, it may actually be completely unusable. But I fish in a heated shanty most of the time, so braided setups are perfect. If you're above freezing or if you're in a heated shelter, 
I would go with braid and then a fluorocarbon leader. I do about a probably eight or 10 foot fluorocarbon leader. I'm going maybe eight to 10 pound on that leader. Again, this is not something where fish are coming up and looking at it and seeing the line. I'm chasing, these, I'm moving this bait, right? So that eight or 10 pound line is not a big deal. I know people that fish really light line for Lakers, that's not me. I don't fish light line for most things. I don't think you need it a lot of times. So I use a fluorocarbon leader, probably eight to 10 feet, also eight to 10 pound. All right, I wanna go through a little bit of sonar units. So in my first video, I did a tutorial on the Vexilar FL18. I still use and love that device. It's my favorite device to ice fish with for sonar. Um, again, you need that sonar to know what's going on. You need that sonar to be able to get the, to know where these fish are, to be able to do these chases and to be effective in any way, really. Um, a couple of things that I would say about sonar units. Um, the first is a transducer. I've had a lot of people asking questions about, first of all, I've had people bring their devices on the ice and they can't get them working the greatest, um, or they buy a new device and they can't get it working the greatest. Um, you know, I think um, the transducer makes a difference for sure. Um, one of the big things that I've had trouble with, so the Vexilar units are great. Any of the flasher style units are seem to be really good, uh, whether it's, you know, Vexilar, Markham, Humminbird, whatever. Um, the big thing that's really important is making sure that you can see a line that's your, that your lure and that you can see a line that's a fish. Even if they're very close, you need that separation so you know what's the lure and what's the fish. That's the important part. If you can't see the difference in those things, it's not a good sonar unit. Okay? Transducers make a difference. So I've had a lot of people asking me questions um, about trying to get things to work properly. And a lot of times it boils down to the transducer. So first of all, is the transducer, <laughs> is the transducer good enough for what you're seeing? You want to make sure it has that separation. So the flasher units are great, but they're super expensive. This, this um, FL18 was probably around 700 bucks. I don't even know, like 10 years ago. They're expensive. They're really expensive, but they're awesome. Um, there's a lot of other graph style um, sonar units out there now that people use or maybe they adapt. I struggled to find a secondary unit. So for years, I needed to find a secondary unit. When I guide people, I need to have an extra unit. Uh, if I bring a friend out, I want to have an extra unit. Um, everybody needs to have their own sonar unit to make it effective. So I looked for a long time trying to find a sonar unit that was good. Um, I don't have this set up for ice right now, but the Garmin Striker 4 has been absolutely awesome. It comes in an ice kit. I just don't have it set up in the ice kit because I also use it for soft water fishing on my hornback. Um, this has been, the, the big key with this is the chirp technology in the sonar, the, in the transducer itself. Um, so if you've got something with chirp, it gives you a lot of detail. So I can very clearly see the difference between my lure and a, and a, and a, and a fish on this. With this though, if you have a standard transducer and you don't have an ice transducer, so the ice transducers are really sweet because no matter what you do, that transducer is going to hang perfectly flat down, right? That's the most important part of any sonar unit that you're going to be using is, is that transducer aiming straight down? If it was crooked like that, you are not going to be able to see your bait. You're not going to be able to see the separation. You're not going to get accurate depth readings. It's got to hang straight down. Okay, so the ice deucers are great because they always hang straight down. With the Garmin Striker 4 that I've reviewed and absolutely love, the biggest thing with this or any other graph style unit that doesn't have a transducer that's made for ice is it has to hang perfectly parallel to the ice. So this part right here, let's see if I can get that cord out of the way. This part right here has to be completely parallel to the ice surface. If this was off a little bit, that is not gonna work. It needs to hang perfectly parallel to that ice surface. This is gonna work, okay? Biggest question I receive on the site is trying to get a transducer to work. Gotta hang parallel to the bottom so that that is aiming straight down. That is really key. So there's different modes you can use on these sonar units as well. When I did the original video and I did the tutorial on the FL18, um, I was only in about 60 feet of water. So you saw on that video, I set it to a certain zoom level that would get me down to that level. And then I put it on the auto zoom, which gave me the bottom six feet of the water column on the one side and the full display on the right side. That's great when you can utilize that full display. 
the zoom levels on at least the FL18, I'm not sure about the other models that go that are newer, but the zoom levels on this go 1, 2, 3, 4, and then 10x. So once you get beyond that 80 feet, and you got to go to 10x, so if I'm fishing in 100 feet of water, and I use an auto zoom, I'm going to have the bottom 6 feet on the left side, and I'm going to have the top one 200 feet on the right side. So essentially, all I'm going to be able to use if I'm in 100 feet of water, I only got a quarter of the screen, right? So if I'm using the bottom lock and I only got a quarter of the screen, that kind of sucks. It doesn't really work that well, okay? So what I do in those deeper situations where I have to go to that 10x and I lose a lot of the screen, I'll turn the auto zoom off and then I'll get the full 360 degree view for that 200 feet. And then at least if I'm in 100 feet, I'm at least getting half of the screen to be able to work with, right? So play with your settings, figure out what you like. For the Vexilars, that's what I really like. Anything beyond 80 feet, I remove the auto zoom. Anything where I'm up to 80 feet, I usually use the auto zoom so I can see that fish coming up on the left side. If you're using more of a graph style sonar, you've seen in some of the other videos I did, I did the Striker 4, uh, Garmin Striker 4 tutorial videos, both the shallow water and the deep water. In the deep water, I used, this, I used a few different modes, right? So there's the regular mode, there was a zoom mode, which zoomed in on the, the bottom was about, about a third of the water column, which gave you a decent amount of clarity. But when a fish chases up really fast, you can't really see it really well, especially when the fish gets right there. It's really hard to see because it's all the way over on the far right side. You can't see much of a, of a depiction between the lure and the bait or the lure and the fish. So it gets a little hard to use to know where that fish really is. I like the history of the graph, but that not being able to see what's on the right side as clearly is kind of really, that was the only thing I didn't like. So if you're using a graph style sonar unit, I would definitely recommend looking for what they call an A-scope mode. And so what the A-scope does is it still gives you your history on the left side of the screen, but the little sliver of the right side of the screen is more of a vertical flasher. And so you'll be able to see a pretty good portion of that screen is your flashing part. And so you'll see where your lure is, you'll see where the fish are, you can see it a lot more clearly. If you're using a graph style, I highly, highly recommend that you're using some sort of A-scope mode where you can see the flasher on the right side and the history on the left side. Um, that by far has been the most effective on the graph style units. I highly recommend that. All right, I want to get into some of the techniques that I use to get fish to bite. Not every fish is going to be an aggressive chaser. If they're not, you're going to have to play around a little bit. So when a fish doesn't come up and just absolutely crush it, you know, those are the fish that you don't even really need a sonar unit for. Um, but when you get a more sluggish fish, one that's not committing as much, maybe the you know, lure's coming up and they're just kind of hanging back a certain distance from it, not really closing that distance, um, or they're you know, kind of playing with it or whatever, there's different techniques that I use to try to get that fish to engage. Okay, so the first thing that I see people do that's the biggest mistake, I would say this is the biggest mistake that people can make, is that they retrieve that lure too slowly. So when a fish comes along, I'm going to have that lure about 10 feet off the bottom, usually, depending on the depth. Um, when that fish comes and that you see that start coming up and they get about halfway there from the bottom, you start to retrieve taking it away from the fish. The thing that I see people do too much is they go way too slow on that retrieve. If that fish is, if that bait is going slowly away, that fish is kind of like, eh, I'm just going to kind of check it out, right? So I think it's really, really important. I have video to show this in a couple, in a lot of different instances. The faster you take it away, the faster you'll know whether or not that fish is going to engage, right? So when that fish gets about halfway there, I take it away pretty fast. Not super fast where they can't catch it, but give it a good pace, right? Make this a fleeing bait fish, right? And you're going to see pretty quickly whether or not that fish is going to engage or not. So within the first three seconds of that chase, if you've gone fast and that fish is still hanging there, it's probably not going to be an active fish. But I've seen a lot of instances where somebody cha chases slowly, they remove that bait slowly, and that fish just kind of comes up and follows, follows, well, you know, not really doing anything. And then I tell them to go faster. You're going too slow, go faster. And you go faster, and all of a sudden that fish charges up and crushes the bait. That's the most important thing. You've got to do a fast retrieve. Make that a fleeing bait fish. Make that something that the lake trout has to chase and go after. You're going to find out really quick whether or not that laker is going to bite if you, if you chase fast, okay? Biggest mistake I see, don't go slow. 
The next biggest mistake I see is when that lake trout catches that bait. So you see your bait coming up and that lake trout comes up and those lines become one. Don't stop. Oh, here comes yep. one. Okay, sorry. Uh, yep, keep going, keep going, keep yep. going, keep going. He's gonna hit, he's gonna hit, he's gonna hit. No, keep going, keep going. Don't stop. As soon as he gets there, you just keep going. It doesn't matter, just keep going. Just keep going. Just keep going. He's coming, he's gonna get it. There he goes. <laughs> right underneath the ice. That's the biggest mistake I see people make. They get there, they get there, they're like, oh my God, they're waiting for that fish. They think they gotta stop it. Don't stop, that fish will disappear if you stop. Most likely, that fish is not gonna bite. You gotta keep going. What you'll see a lot of times is that those that bait, those lines will close, right? So this is the fish, this is your lure. As they're going up, that fish closes the distance and the lines meet, keep going. And then a lot of times what you'll see is you'll see this. You'll see a separation and then a close, a separation and a close. That is that fish going after your bait and swiping and turning around and swiping and turning around and swiping. Keep doing that. That is an incredibly good sign. You keep doing that. Usually on the second, third, fourth swipe is when you're going to get a hit. So if you see that happening, just keep going. Do not stop. That's the second biggest mistake I see is people stop. Don't ever stop that retrieve. Okay. What happens when you start to run out of real estate, right? You're down at 100 feet of water. That fish is coming up. You're chasing, chasing, chasing. You keep going. You keep going. He's there. He's active. He's playing with you, but he hasn't committed yet. Keep going until you get really close to the ice. So once you get to like 10 feet of the ice, start slowing it down at, the, at 10 feet from the ice. A lot of times these guys are going to hit right under the ice. It happens all the time. So just keep going. What happens if you run out and you can't go any further? Go back down. All right. When that fish comes up and he's right there and he's under the ice, you, you might play with him a little bit, see if you can get a, a hit. But then honestly, I drop it right back down and I make him chase down. All right, so that's why I, I like having heavy baits because you need to be able to move them up and down quickly a lot of times. So I give a downward chase. Um, that happens a lot. You'll see fish come up. They're not quite committing. You'll chase back and forth over and over again. I've played with fish for five minutes before I actually got a bite, but I've gotten them to bite. So don't ever give up on a fish. If that fish is still there and he's playing, you keep chasing. You run out of real estate, go back down. You run out of real estate, go back up. And always judge what you're doing by what that sonar is telling you. Is that fish still right on the bait? He's still interested. Is he starting to separate from that bait and lose interest, right? If he's starting to lose interest, then you gotta drop back down and try to make those lines meet and try to get him to re-engage. A lot of times they'll start coming back up and playing. You know, it's a game. It's like a video game using these things, right? So you gotta just keep playing these fish and keep working on them until, until they bite or until they disappear. If that fish is still in the cone of view on your sonar, you keep fishing for that fish, okay? All right, one of the other big mistakes that I see is people don't set the hook hard enough on these fish, okay? Um, it's really important if these fish are deep, you know, a lot of times you're fishing 100 feet of water. Um, when these fish hit, they can be down 100 feet, more, a little bit less, but they're down there a ways, and you need to be able to give a good hook set on those fish. That's why I like a slightly longer rod, so I'm going 30, 32 inches on my rods, and honestly, it really depends on how much space I have in my shanty, and whether or not I'm gonna be hitting <laughs> the walls of my shanty and what, what rod I can use. Or if you're out in the open, who cares, right? Just use something that's got a lot of backbone. Backbone is important for setting that hook. Line that doesn't stretch, really important for setting that hook. And here's the tip I, I give people. When you're fishing, don't leave your rod up like this while you're retrieving. You know, you don't want your rod up while you're retrieving so you have no place to go, right? When there's a fish that's chasing, put your rod down to the tip of the hole. Then want that tip just a couple inches from the hole. And you're gonna be reeling with your tip a couple inches from the hole and you're gonna be watching your sonar. Hopefully your sonar is close enough to your rod tip that you can see them both at the same time, okay? You wanna see where that fish is to know if you need to do something different and you want to be able to see that rod tip because a lot of times you won't necessarily feel a lot, but you'll literally just see your rod tip go down like that a little bit. As soon as you see it, as soon as you feel it, you keep reeling and you jerk way up to the top. I want to see a lewd three foot movement at least, maybe four foot movement at least on that hook set. 
Make sure that drag is not loose so that I've done that before. Set the hook on a fish and my drag goes peeling off and I don't get a good hook set. Got him. Fish on. Oh, too tight. Too loose. Too loose. Too loose. Too loose. Make sure it's tight enough to give, give a good hook set. And then after that, you can loosen it up a little bit if you need to fight that fish and let it, let it run. But that hook set is going to be key. You've got to bury that hook into that fish, okay? All right. Now, what if they actually hit, but they don't hook up? This happens all the time too. They're gonna swipe at this bait and they might hit it and they might hook up for a little bit. They might come off, they might miss it completely. Keep going, all right? Judge what that fish is doing. Take a look at the sonar, keep going. Did that fish drop off? Is he going back down or is he kind of hanging around the same level? I've had plenty of instances where I've hooked a fish, come off, and I thought for sure, oh, that fish is never going to bite again. Well, lo and behold, I go back down a little bit and that fish starts coming back up after it. I've, had, I've actually guided multiple people telling them, okay, drop back down to that fish. Okay, now take it away. And when you take it away, that fish is right after it again. They hook up and they catch the fish. Dude, he's on it. Drop it. He's coming again. He's coming again. He felt it, but he's still coming. He's still coming. Still coming. Yep. Dude, what the? F oh my god. Don't ever give up on a fish. Whether he's felt that lure or not, keep going. Okay, so a lot of times fish are going to give half hearted chases. They're not always going to be in the mood to bite. Okay? Um, you got to play with these fish a little bit. So, what I'll do is, again, I always start off with a fast retrieve. If the fast retrieve is too much for those fish and they give up on it really quickly, I'm going to adapt a little bit. I'm going to start going a little bit slower, okay? So the next fish that comes up, I'm going to go a little bit slower and see if I can keep him engaged. If I can get that fish to stay within range at least, at least I've got a little more interest and there's a possibility of getting a bite. I always say start fast, adapt, and go slower, okay? Much better that way than the other way. When I've had a fish that's chased a few times, like literally up, down, up, down, haven't gotten a bite yet, <laughs> Um, those fish are really interesting sometimes. They're, they show interest, but they just, they're just they lockjawed. They won't bite. Here's a couple of things you can try. Okay, so after I've, I've done a couple of chases up and down and I haven't gotten a bump or a bite, I drop it straight back down to the bottom and I let it sit on the bottom. What do you want to see is you want to keep that fish engaged as it's dropping down. And then when it gets close to the bottom, let it drop on the bottom. Make a little cloud of you know silt or whatever on the bottom, hopefully and just let it sit there for you know maybe four or five seconds and a lot of times you'll be able to see on the bottom of the screen you'll be able to see the sonar that the fish is still there as long as that fish is still there he's still checking it out okay so two things i've had fish take it off the bottom i've been guiding people and they've had to take it off the bottom so there's always that and then a lot of times what i'll do is i'll set it on the bottom for four or five seconds and then i'll start a new chase and I've had a couple of times where I've had tough fish that have been chasing up and down, up and down, haven't been able to get a bite. I drop it to the bottom, I let it set for about five seconds, and then I start another chase, and that's when I get a hit. Let's try this. I'm going to set it on the bottom. He's still there, checking it out. Let's see if I can get him to come up after it. Yes! Keep playing with these fish, keep adapting, keep doing different things and trying that out. So hitting bottom, tapping the bottom with your lure, um, all different techniques that you can try if the chase isn't happening the way that you want. Okay, if you're out and you're not really seeing much activity or the activity you're seeing is really slow, start getting erratic. Um, start doing things with those baits, jerking them up really hard, you know, jerking them. Um, just trying to get a lot of attention. I've had times where uh, I haven't seen a fish in 30 minutes. Um, just they're not around. I don't know. They're not interested. They're not moving. And I'll just do a fake chase. I'll just like I haven't seen anything in a while. I'll just start reeling like I'm chasing. And I'll come all the way up to underneath the ice because you never know. On a couple of instances, I've been reeling up and about halfway through, all of a sudden a fish shows up on the sonar and it'll either chase or sometimes they'll hit. So if you're not seeing anything, start getting erratic, start making some motion, start trying to get some attention, see if you can get somebody to show up. It's definitely a good way to try to mix things up and try to get some activity. I've definitely had fish come around and, and, and get interested after doing that kind of stuff. All right, so in terms of baits, um, there are different baits that I use. You know, if you watch my videos, you know that about 90% of the time, if not more, I'm using some sort of swim bait 
Um, so you can saw in the previous video, I like the Gulp 4-inch Smelt Minnow. Um, you know, this has a lot of scent in it. Um, it has a pretty straight tail though. It doesn't have as much tail action, but uh, it has a really great scent and um, it looks like the bait fish that I have. So we have smelt in our, in our lakes and a lot of times, you know, we catch a fish, it'll cough up a smelt um, and you'll actually see that it looks exactly like our bait. So I do use the gulp, but not quite as much anymore. These are my favorites now. This is a swim bait that I like to use. Um, it looks really, really just like those fish. It's got a paddle tail, so it gives a little bit more action when it's doing the swimming motion. And again, you can see I always use those heavy jig heads. So I'm using a 3 8 ounce, 3 8 ounce jig head on these things. You know, we talked about before, you want to be able to move that lure both up and down quickly. You want to get down to a fish, you want to make a fish chase down. So I really like these. Again, everything that I use, I'll have links down in the description so you guys can kind of see those things and maybe get some yourselves. Okay, so swim baits are, the, are by, by far the bait I use the most, but they're not always the right bait. So if I see a couple of things, if I see that fish are not necessarily chasing effectively or, you know, I, need to, I feel like I need to do something different. I'm not getting the activity that I want on the swim baits. I'll start changing up. So one of the keys is if I'm getting short strikes on my swim baits. So with these swim baits, all right, that hook is all the way up toward the front. A lot of times, sometimes those fish will be hitting back here. They'll be, and they're not hooking up. If you're getting instances where the fish are really not, they're hitting, but they're not fully hooking up, then you need to start going with the bait that's got a hook further back, okay? So when that's happening, a lot of times I'll switch up to a spoon, okay? All right, so this is a typical spoon that I use. It's just a, um, it's just a crocodile spoon, and it's got a single hook all the way back. You can see that. And so a lot of times that is the key is when the fish are short striking to have a, a hook that's further down below, you know, they're not going to miss so much. So, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll use this and not only that, but the flash sometimes will help draw them in too. So, um, I do use spoons. You can see I've got a, a pretty big Swedish pimple on this one. Um, but again, those, those hooks are much further back on those, right? So, um, if you're getting short strikers, Switch up to some spoons. Try some spoons that have the hook much further back and see if you get hooked up. I've saved a couple of days just by making that switch. Okay. Now, if the water is maybe not as clear, uh, maybe the lakes you're fishing, the, the water's not so clear, you might need a little bit more to grab their attention. So either, you know, a little more flash or vibration, right? So there's a couple of things that I'll do um, outside of swim baits or spoons. Okay, so one of those is using a blade bait. And you saw in one of my videos uh, last year that I did use blade baits. Um, and I think that they made a big difference in that particular trip. Let's see if I get these things unhooked. So one of the other baits that I'll use is a blade bait. Um, these baits provide a lot of vibration and a lot of flash sometimes. So essentially you tie them to the middle and you give them short bursts like this. And when you do it, it vibrates a lot and it can call those fish in. I have had some pretty decent um, days using a blade bait. The one thing I'll caution you on a blade bait is I feel like the fish come off a lot easier. Um, when they're engulfing a swim bait, they're usually not gonna come off. It's a single hook inside the mouth. It's kind of protected. With these blade baits, you know, those hooks are on the outside of the bait. Um, you know, those hooks are on the outside of the bait. They can tend to either catch the ice or be on the outside of the mouth of the fish. And so I really feel like they can come off a little bit easier sometimes. But if you are having trouble getting fish to bite, try switching up to a blade bait. I've had really good days on these. Just my percentage of landing isn't as good when I'm, when I'm using a blade bait. So I would say if the swim baits aren't working, switch to a blade bait. If it's maybe a little bit darker or, or discolored water, use something with a little more vibration like a blade bait. Um, the other bait that I'll try is a lipless crankbait. All right, a lipless crankbait also provides a lot of vibration. Um, you can use them with different colors, different flash levels, but that's another bait I'll try if, my, if I'm not getting the reaction I want on a swim bait, I will try some lipless crankbaits. Again, I think dirtier water, maybe fish that need a little bit more to get them going, you know, use these things erratically as well. They can also chase. 
Um, they've, they fall really nicely, so this is a red-eye shad. It falls really nicely when it comes back down, but it also chases really well, and it has a lot of vibration in it. Right, so again, another bait that um, potentially can call fish in for you. All right, so if I'm using a swim bait that you know doesn't have built-in scent, you can always add scent to it. Um, I use a little bit of smell oil a lot of times, um, but any, anything that you know provides some maybe more of a natural scent. You know, if that fish is chasing, maybe not fully committing, but he gets a little hint of that smell. You know, that could be a trigger to getting fish to bite. Um, just another thing to try, add to your arsenal if you're, you know, and any hard bait or even a swim bait to see if you can get those fish to bite since they don't have any natural smell to them. Alright, if I have to leave you guys with one thing, that one thing is if it's not working, change it up. Whether it means switching to different baits or different techniques because those fish are not really being aggressive or, you know, if you're not seeing anything, don't be afraid to move. I typically don't move a lot. But if you're not seeing the activity you want to see, try moving out to deeper water, try finding a funnel somewhere, try to go up you know, close to a deep edge, try different things. I don't like to sit still and do the same thing if I'm not getting activity. So I'll first change up baits, techniques, retrieves, see if I can get activity going. If I can't, I'm going to move a little bit, see if I can find those fish. So anyway, I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. It's a lot more detailed information than our first video. And a lot of it's based on just what we've seen when we've been guiding, what we've seen ourselves, and the questions that people have asked us throughout our videos. So I hope this has been really helpful for you guys. Uh, hopefully you can take your ice fishing game to the next level. I would love to kind of hear your stories of, of how this is helping you. And again, if you want to take part in the giveaway, be a subscriber on the channel, give us a thumbs up, and leave a comment letting us know what kind of things you guys want to see. And uh, anyway, hope you guys have an awesome ice fishing season. We'll see you guys soon.